Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Marketing to Gen Z and the Playground of TikTok webinar. We're so thrilled that you have all joined us. I can already see the chat with everyone saying where they're joining us from. So feel free to jump in there and let us know. Company, city, at home, in office, whatever's going on. Uh, we're so, so thrilled again to have you all here. We have an incredible list of RSVPs and we're so excited to talk to you about everything that we have prepared. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce myself and also introduce a handful of the wonderful speakers that you'll be hearing from from our team. So my name is Grace Murray. I'm the Vice President of Strategy here at Four. Uh, we're an ambassador marketing company based out of New York City. We've been around now for about seven years and have the pleasure of working with some of the world's most incredible brands like Sephora, Best Buy, Coles, Unilever, um, Dyson, so many others. So uh, I've been here with four since the very early days. I was uh, employee number three, and it's been incredible to see not just the company really grow, but also the industry go from strength to strength. So uh, thrilled to be here. And we'll also be hearing from Sophie Wood, who is a star account executive on our Sephora account. She's also an influencer in her own right, one of my favorite followers. Um, so check her out on Instagram and TikTok. Um, but she will be talking about the basics of Gen Z, their psyche, their consumer behavior, um, and really just kind of giving us the lay of the land before we get into the nitty gritty. We're then going to hear from Alexis, who is a senior account executive on our four Best Buy account and one of the funniest people I ever met. Uh, Alexis will be talking about TikTok, um, Gen Z behavior on TikTok in terms of consumption and creation. Um, Roshana will then be talking about um, white space on TikTok for brands as we see it, some big opportunities that we feel like aren't necessarily being capitalized on yet. And through that, we're going to look at a handful of sample profiles um, who are pretty niche and might not necessarily be the exact fit for your brand, but they have an incredible audience, huge engagement, um, and really, really, really low sponsored content percentages. So, um, you know, it's going to be awesome to see some of those and hopefully get everyone's wheels turning. And in between all of that, I'm going to be talking about uh, what's new as it relates to influence marketing on TikTok, as well as what's the same. It's a pretty intimidating platform for a lot of marketers. A lot of brands are still really gun shy. Um, and so we're here really today to just you know, demystify things, talk about, again, what's new and what hasn't changed. So with that, I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Sophie. Thanks, Grace. Uh, so as she mentioned, I'm Sophie Wood. I'm an account executive here at Four. And outside of my nine to five, I'm also an influencer within the beauty, fashion and lifestyle space. So definitely the best of both worlds. And I'm excited to dive into all things Gen Z and TikTok with you today. Um, so to really understand marketing towards Gen Z, we have to break down who Gen Z is because many of us truly have no clue. They are the new generation on the block. So starting with the basics, as we like to call it, Gen Zers right now are between the ages of six and 24. Now that is a pretty huge age gap that could literally be your child, could also be your coworker. So a really great way to distinguish the difference between Gen Z and millennials is that Gen Z was actually not cognizant of 9-11. So this is very important because that catastrophic event is essentially what causes a major psyche shift and the schism between millennials and Gen Z, as um, experts like to call it. So for Gen Z, peaceful world, don't know her, honestly never did. So let me elaborate. So taking a look inside Gen Z's brain and suppressed memories, here's what we know. So they were not cognizant of 9-11, have never known a peaceful world. Um, they also watched their parents live and suffer through the 2008 recession. So this could be that they were evicted from their childhood home uh, due to foreclosure. Maybe their parent lost a job or maybe their parents used up all their college savings because they really needed to to stay afloat. You get the idea. In the same vein, many Gen Zers in public school actually watched their own school funding get cut and never fully recover as a result of the recession. So I actually remember watching my teachers panic and cry in class because we had to take what were called furlough days, which were essentially days that we had off of school because the schools didn't have enough money anymore to pay the teachers for the full year. So that was very sad and it also made the effects of the recession feel very real even at a young age. 
Moving forward, the first ever election that Gen Z could participate in was the 2016 election, no less, and we all know how that went. So hope at this point is literally non-existent. And to top it all off, lived through a pandemic, which I need not explain since we were all there, clearly. So life as they know it is full of conflict, it's full of uncertainty, it's full, in, full of anxiety, but they're realist. They really do hope for something better at the same time. Uh, they are no bullshit. They do not want to be old and they want the truth cut and dry. So all of this inner psyche shenanigans plays a part into the type of consumer that Gen Z is. And when I say consumer, I mean both as a consumer of social media and also a consumer as in using my money to buy things. So we can break that down together. So starting with Gen Z as a consumer of social media. So I am so sorry to all of my millennials out there, but no more escape of social media. Gen Z doesn't want to log on and see your perfect life with your perfect boyfriend, with your perfect house and your zero problems. Cry selfies are in, we all have mental illness, it's fine. And also filters are out and shit posting is in. So a Facetune thirst trap by the pool might not cut it anymore, but be on the lookout for DGAF photo dumps garnering a 10% engagement rate actually. And then probably one of my least favorite characteristics of Gen Z is that they are the kings and queens of unsolicited advice. So kind of in the same wheelhouse, they love some good cancel culture. They always think they're right. And most important for brands, they will call you out on your BS. And last, they don't like to be fooled. So just follow FTC guidelines. It's legal for you. It's transparent for them. And they'll be stoked to see their favorite influencer in their bag as long as that partnership is authentic. So in the wise words of Travis Eckmark, who is our creative director here at Four, no fake love. So moving on to Gen Z as a consumer. So at the heart of everything, they are a value-based consumer. So some key points that Gen Z will consider are, is the brand inclusive? Is the brand sustainable? And ultimately, where do their values stand and do they align with mine? So tying that all back into influencer marketing, Gen Z in particular likes to be influenced by creators who are relatable and not aspirational. So this kind of ties back into that not wanting social media to be escapist anymore. They want the real deal. And frankly, they wanna know that their favorite influencer has problems too. So that is a quick little overview of who Gen Z is and how we can think of them as a consumer. And now I'm going to pass it over to Miss Alexis to talk through some detail around their content creation and consumption behavior on TikTok. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alexis and I'm a senior account executive here at Four. Um, I have some big shoes to kind of fill here um, because Grace did call me the funniest person she knows. So I'll see like what I can do there. Um, so really when thinking about brand strategy, I often think of the phrase, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, as you know, we really are in the business of making people drink and, and we want them to enjoy it. Um, so how do we do that? Um, personally, we meet Gen Z where they are. And as Sophie mentioned, um, Gen Z is on social media. So nearly 50% of Gen Z spend at least six hours of screen time on their device each day. So it's really no wonder that more than 80% of them learn about new products via social media, um, trust information about these products when they're shared by shoppers versus more of a traditional form of advertising. Um, so as articulated through this tweet, you'll note that Gen Z are creators first and consumers second. Um, the world through which Gen Z has grown up in really has made them more attuned to how the world works than previous generations. Um, they really don't just accept things as they are and consume them. Naturally, um, they work to deconstruct them so that they can not only create, um, but challenge and really reimagine them as well. Um, so this type of user behavior comes to life in this education as entertainment content that is an enormous part of the TikTok ecosystem. Uh, a lot of people mistake TikTok for dancing and lip syncing only. Um, but it's also about learning how to code, uh, interview tips, how to compost, how to get into business school, um, learning on TikTok, which was an initiative that launched in 2020, has seen the platform flooded with content ranging from mathematics, um, upcycling, architecture, how to decorate a cake. Um, so that hashtag, which is learn on TikTok, has 91.3 billion views, like 
yes, billion, 91.3, it's a ton. Um, and it really does speak to this generation's comfort level in ongoing independent upskilling, online education. Um, and it's very evident that Gen Z really takes pride in being informed, living with purpose, and really speaking as experts and leaders. Um, so it's, as Sophie mentioned, and, and brought this into um, light before that it really is no secret that Gen Z is all about lo-fi content. Um, and it's not just about shit posting, um, it's about sponsored content as well. Um, that lo-fi vibe really aims to quite literally remove that veil of um, bullshit and just really get straight to the root of realness. Um, and this can be scary for advertisers that have an aesthetic um, but it really does translate into trustworthiness for Gen Z consumers. Um, and as far as brands who do feel like that vibe or lo-fi is pretty off brand, um, what we like to think of is this concept of windows and mirrors. So for anyone who's recently seen the Fran Lebowitz documentary, um, she said that people say, I didn't like that book. I didn't see myself in it. Um, but it had never occurred to me that a book would be a mirror. Um, a book is more of a window. So the same thing can be said for the shift that brands need to make when thinking about Gen Z creators. Um, you don't necessarily want content to be a mirror back to your brand. Um, you really do want it to be more of that window. So allowing Gen Z creators to make content that feels natural to them um, you really are inviting in a whole trusting audience to, to peep through that window uh, into the world of your brand. Um, and then moving on to brand values. So uh, Sophie also mentioned earlier that Gen Z makes note of brand stance on social issues. Um, Gen Z has been very involved in the social activism, you know, since a much younger age than other generations. Um, and it really is why socially conscious brands like Ben and Jerry's um, are really finding huge success in today's market. Um, in short, Gen Z really does have little patience for companies that are full of shit. So if your company um, does claim to support a cause, uh, definitely be prepared to show up. Um, and obviously, of course, we know that not every brand um, is Ben and Jerry's and that many of us have bosses who do want, you know, the TikTok feed to be as manicured and, and on brand as other platforms. Uh, so if that is you, I'm going to kick it back over uh, to Grace on, on where you go from there. Okay, thank you, Alexis. So, you know, we've heard from the horse's mouth, uh, what gets Gen Z going, what grinds their gears, but I'm sure there are a lot of you out there who are still kind of scratching your head about, well, how, the, how does this make sense for my brand or how are we gonna make this work? So, you know, what if you are Ben and Jerry's and maybe, you know, in terms of um, the initiatives or stances your company is taking on certain issues, you're not quite there yet and there's quite a long way to go. Uh, brand safety has been a huge topic of conversation for us and how does it work when the whole generation is very unfiltered and what does that mean for our brand and investing in these creators? Uh, we talked about shit posts before, which is a real term that everyone uses, um, but there's a little bit of like, well, should we really be investing our marketing budget in content that is literally named that? Um, and so there's also this nerves around potential missteps um, about cancel culture, or about the Gen Z consumer base calling your brand out. Um, so there is a, a reluctance uh, to participate until there is that confidence or wanting competitors to test things first before actually jumping into the waters. You're not alone. So the first thing I want to say is that this is the, the entire industry is pretty polar ends of the spectrum. So there's zero or 100, zero being holding firm, not really doing a whole lot quite yet, maybe like Coca-Cola, not even having posted on the account yet, but having a bunch of followers um, and really just kind of being bullish on what the actual strategy is until things kind of settle and there's more of a, a benchmark or a playbook on how to make, how to be successful. 
On the opposite end of the spectrum, there's brands who are absolutely killing it on TikTok. And so much of the industry conversation is now saturated in becoming viral and going viral and a viral brand challenge and how to pull that off. Um, even in the research and, and discussion that we're all having about this webinar, nearly every article that you see out there is about the brands that are creating viral challenges. Um, and, you know, that's great. That's great to have um, that ability or it's amazing for those brands who are doing really well, but for the brands who haven't really gotten off the starting block yet, we do see it as a reluctance because of the fear and uncertainty around how to be successful, how it all works, you know, what has changed and what is different. So that's what I'm going to focus on today, really just demystifying what it is, uh, what it's not, what's new and what's no different as it relates specifically to influencer marketing. So the first thing that's different, unfortunately, is that it is a little brutal out here. So it's a much less forgiving place than Instagram. On Instagram, really the worst case scenario you're looking at with a sponsored post is that it doesn't perform that well. And maybe some of the comments are from the influencer's friends saying how much they love the brand and that they can't wait to buy it because they're in a comment pod. On TikTok, either, you know, the views can be really, really low because of the way that the algorithm works, which we're going to get into a little later on. Um, or even a step further than that, sometimes there can be negative backlash from the audience. They're much more likely to comment on whether or not they think this is an authentic partnership. So this is an example from Amazon in which they engaged a creator to go to one of their factories and interview um, some of their staff. And obviously Amazon the, is the biggest retailer in the world and they have been under heavy criticism by Gen Z specifically a lot in the past 12 months. So it is a really tough starting block to be working from. But I think the lesson that we can all learn here is in the comments and in the sentiment, which isn't just about the brand and who they are and what they stand for and it not being a partnership that a lot of the audience expected but also specifically that the editing is really high quality and that made it off brand for the influencer. So again, a pretty tough starting block to be um, working from for Amazon. But the lesson for all of us here is that if we're leveraging creators to help shift the perception of our brand, we do really need to respect their understanding of their audience, their natural inclination to lower fire content um, and really work with them to get buy-in on a concept that will actually resonate with their audience and also hit your goals and KPIs. So, you know, again, we don't want to be working with Gen Z to mirror and reflect exactly the brand's view of how they see themselves. We want to use it as a window into a new audience. So something that's the same, um, though perhaps much heavier importance than on Instagram, um, is this concept of building a fence and letting them play, which is something that we've evangelized for a long time in briefing. And if we look back at the history of the industry, the original fence looked like this first photo. So barely visible, a lot of creative control over to the influencer and a lot of excitement for that creativity and, and hoping for the best in, in what comes back. Um, but really because the industry was in such an infantile place, there wasn't a solid understanding from marketers of the type of information that was okay to be really clear about in terms of needs and wants and desires um, and setting someone up for success. So, you know, we gave all of this creative freedom, a barely visible fence. And then what we saw was a couple of years of constant reshoot requests, um, you know, caption complete rewrites from brands. And so then there was this pendulum swing for the creators where they kind of stopped being creative on Instagram for a lot of sponsored content and instead stuck really, really close to whatever the key messages were. We've joked before here that some sponsored content can kind of feel like the creator has taken the, you know, key messages and just put, hey, fam, at the beginning and swipe up at the end. And that's really not what we want to be doing. Um, and, you know, there was a feeling from marketers that that was influencers phoning it in. But looking back on the history of the industry, what could you kind of expect them to do if they're reshooting and rewriting all of the time? So then we got to this place where in the middle, we've got a really, really restrictive fence, uh, which on TikTok just fundamentally isn't going to work. Um, so we need to be at a place where we're building a fence as marketers, where we're setting the creator up for success, but there's enough room to play within it. 
And it's important to remember that authenticity in sponsored content isn't the influencer's job, that's our job. So we need to make sure that we are assessing all of our briefs through the lens of, is this going to work towards getting to my KPIs and have I been clear about those? Um, but also, is there enough room here to be able to do something interesting and give the audience what they ultimately came for, which is education, entertainment and inspiration and not necessarily an ad. So we're going to talk through an example here of uh, a TikTok collaboration that we worked on with our client OXO. Um, this was a super niche account. Um, so the opportunity here was that there is this insane account um, called Sync Reviews that popped up in, I think it was October of last year, grew an audience of over 500,000 within three months. Um, at the time that we noticed this account, there was zero sponsored content on it and over half a million followers and regularly getting 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 views. So we saw this as an opportunity for 100% share of voice. A uh, huge Gen Z audience and the fans were, there's literally someone got a tattoo of, of a sink based on this account. So it's a pretty wild type of account and interesting opportunity that just doesn't exist on Instagram because someone with that type of a following would have already been leveraged by many, many brands over the gradual build of that following. So in engaging this creator, the fence that we built, knowing how specific the content is and that it could go terribly wrong if we didn't um, provide creative freedom, we said, okay, we need content submission prior to shooting. We need three audible mentions of OXO. We need the product prominently displayed in content for a minimum of three shots. We want a thank you to OXO for sponsoring the video as the verbal disclosure to be really upfront about that. Um, and we wanted the brand to be sincerely positioned in a positive light. I should also say that OXO has over 20 specific products for sinks. So they seem like a weird, wacky match made in heaven. Um, and fingers crossed the audio is going to work. I'm going to play the video for you all right now to get a sense of, based on this type of a brief, um, the content that came back, and then we'll take a look at the results. The kind folks at OXO saw the enthusiastic response to this unique sync and wanted to help make it even better. Although its design is groundbreaking, quite frankly, it needed a little bit of love. Every sink deserves consideration and dignity, be it a lavish marble sink in a museum or something more humble like this. OXO believes that even the everyday humble sink can be better. Just as Shakespeare wrote, full merrily the humble bee doth sing, so too does this modest sink cry out in song. Thank you to OXO for sponsoring this video and for always believing in the inherent majesty that exists within each and every sink. Okay, so we got some great results. Um, our goal here was never virality, which again is just a big um, industry focus right now in all of the conversations that we're hearing and the things that we're reading. Um, but we're just really focused a lot of the time on finding these opportunities to work with interesting accounts that really perfectly match up with our brands. So we have been measuring engagement in two different ways. So engagement versus follow account and engagement versus views. So engagement versus follower count at nearly 12% and engagement versus views at around 23%. We projected the 80,000 views based on averages um, of the most recent, I believe it was 30 posts. And we saw nearly 400,000 views. So a really, really strong over delivery. Um, but again, something that we often say in one of our ambassador mindset rules is that we like to persuade, we like to prioritize persuasion over performance. And that really means that our team lives in the comments and really works to understand the sentiment of what really resonated with this about the audience or didn't um, and what we can learn from it. So we've pulled out some sentiment themes here that I think can be applied to so many different um, types of TikTok collaborations when we're specifically targeting Gen Z. So the first is shared excitement for getting the bag. So you know, comment example here from reviewing sinks to sinking in money, you'd love to see it. <laughs> um, a lot of this type of commentary, and this is really common um, and something that we see as a really big positive. Um, you know, again, Gen Z are really cognizant of how the business of influence works. And so to us, 
an audience being excited that someone that they follow and admire is being paid by a brand is a positive brand halo moment for our client. So um, this is something that we will continue to see. We'll see in a lot of different sponsored content on TikTok, and it doesn't really happen as much on Instagram. Love of transparency is a second one and a huge one. Um, so, you know, an example here, you were upfront about it being an ad and it was a fun TikTok to watch. I wouldn't mind you posting ads like these often. Get that bag again, back to the creator making money. Bravo to this ad. A lot of commentary about it being a genius sponsored ad and it being um, of great balance of still giving the audience this very strange, unique content that they came for, but also you know, promoting the brand in a way that does put the product um, and the brand in the forefront and doesn't try and conceal that it's a sponsored post. There's also a ton of brand specific commentary in the comments. So one thing that OXO struggle with specifically is that uh, a lot of people think the brand is OXO. A bunch of people in the comments actually saying that. So nice to see an actual reaction to one of their very real problems um, and a huge amount of OXO brand love a lot of which was, again, tied to how great it was that OXO was sponsoring this account um, and how happy the audience was for the creator. So really interesting stuff to see there. And this really brings us to the next key difference on TikTok with Gen Z specifically, and that's that the business of influence is really on display. So when Instagram influencers started making money, there really wasn't an industry that existed yet um, or a precedent for talking about the ins and outs of it. So while many TikTok creators have only been around for a short period of time, they are really, really savvy when it comes to how to negotiate brand deals or contract watch outs or you know, landing brand deals at all. So if you have a little peruse through hashtag influencer tips, uh, which has 168 million views on TikTok, or hashtag influencer marketing, uh, which has 50 million views, you'll see these hashtags flooded with videos like five contract watch outs or how to price a brand deal or ways to charge as an influencer, majority of which were created by Gen Z. And this rapid dissemination of information is really speeding things up when it comes to the industry maturing and you know things becoming a little bit more standardized or conversations around pricing being more transparent. And it does force us as marketers to examine what we actually need versus what we've always just assumed as the norm. So we track our payout data at four and in analyzing over $8 million in payout data from the past 12 months, we have seen an, a 44% increase in influencer rates across the board. Um, there are many cultural and seismic shifts that have contributed to that. But it's also, I think this, you know, the business of influence being on display through TikTok and also through Clubhouse has been a huge contributing factor. Uh, and our team is reporting that usage is often one of the biggest pieces that are driving those costs up. Um, so, you know, and again, this visibility of the business of influence speaks back to the commentary that we saw in both the Amazon post and the OXO post about consumers and audiences discussing live whether or not an ad on TikTok is effective. So some tips here on how to, you know, tackle this. So um, disclosure and reasonable contracts are integral and important. Um, and a couple of tips. So the first one is pay fairly, not wastefully. So pre-2020, we really saw six to 12 months as the default repost rights usage requests from nearly all of our clients. And we really never got any pushback for that organic usage. So paid usage has always been costly, but organic usage, not as much. In the past 12 months, it's really become something that people are referencing a lot more, um, particularly because brands really did start to use the content uh, on their websites, in their emailers, really heavily on social because they weren't able to shoot you know, traditional ad content throughout the pandemic. So the usage conversation for organic has become a big one. And a tip from us is to just reduce your default usage on TikTok to one month instead of whatever your legal department has defaulted and assumed as the norm. 
it is a big budget drain throughout the whole industry. And really, if you're not going to be reposting the content within a month on TikTok, you're probably not going to be reposting it. So there's no need to pay for something that you're not going to use. Um, and the next piece is with FTC and being transparent. So if you mentioned before, you know, if it's an ad, just say that. Um, the business of influence, again, completely on display. People understand now how it works. And it doesn't have to be how we all approached Instagram in the early days of FTC disclosure, where everyone was trying to kind of bury the disclosure and hide that it was a sponsorship. That's not going to work with Gen Z. They're going to be able to see through it. So it's better to be upfront and remember that investing in creative people um, and their audience or audiences seeing them do well is something that can be celebrated and not concealed. Um, so sentiment again about getting the bag is a good thing when working with Gen Z. So the next big question around TikTok and Gen Z specifically is about, you know, how do we tackle uh, brand safety when we are working with a generation who are by nature very unfiltered? You know, it's worth thinking about that a lot of Instagram influencers were born out of blogs. Um, so, of course, they did have point of view as a central piece of their content but they also were largely e-com destinations. So the influencer Instagram world was in large part born out of accounts that were already fundamentally focused on promoting products um, and saw those platforms from the beginning as something that they could monetize potentially. Whereas for Gen Z and on TikTok, so many people have rapidly built audiences, not necessarily through um, promoting products or talking about products, but just from self-expression and a desire to connect and the platform blowing up so uh, quickly and significantly. So audience and influence always does need to be considered regardless of which platform we're on. The thing that's new for Gen Z is that we as marketers have to market with them and not at them. And so, you know, while some creators may be too risky to work with, we would still recommend examining your brand safety language for any ambiguity or antiquations. So, um, you know, some common vague and unrealistic clauses that we see all the time when we get new MSAs or new contracts coming through from brands are that they don't want influencers who are overtly political, um, who use profanity or who are sexual or provocative in any way. Um, now, all of those things, when it comes to identifying influences in Gen Z, they're pretty vague, but they're also makes things very challenging because, again, it's very innate to who they are. So some tips here. So if we see if your standard is saying not overtly political, the first one is to just ask for clear lines to be drawn by your leaders so you can play within a realistic fence and so you can be identifying creators and influences who have a really strong connection with their audience, which is often goes hand in hand with them being expressive about where they stand on social issues or political issues. Um, trying to move guidelines away from broad political affiliation and instead towards specifics that your brand doesn't want to be affiliated with. So hate speech, spreading of misinformation, discrimination of any kind, uh, being more specific about the things that you, you deem to be unsafe instead of just talking about politics or social issues in general is a really helpful lens to add. And again, to give yourself a realistic fence. Um, the third one is a post buffer. So, you know, different brands have different comfort levels. Um, this is something that we've seen work really well with some of the larger corporations that we work with who have, are very nervous about working with anyone who has expressed any level of political view. Basically a post buffer is saying, we're contracting you for this post. Um, the post, of course, is not political in nature, but as part of your contract, we also want to ensure that one post either side or multiple posts either side isn't political or charged in nature to just give it a little bit of a buffer and, and avoid the feeling of going from one really heavy, intense topic that doesn't feel brand safe to your specific company and right into your ad. So, that's been something that's been really effective for those um, more conservative brands or more established um, larger ships that are tougher to re-steer. The next one, again, vague and a little, um, a little antiquated depending on the brand that you are, but not overtly sexual or provocative. 
um, you know, yeah. all understanding their bodies, feeling attractive. It's pretty normal to be. Um, understanding what that means for your brand and where the lines are. Um, we were doing some influencer identification recently uh, for a brand and nearly every single influencer who was Gen Z and very cool had been engaged by Savage Fenty and that ruled nearly everyone out. So um, it's just something to bear in mind. Um, the next one is evangelizing duality as a mentality. So a little bit of a, you can be both type of a, a feel. Um, again, there's young, incredible CEOs out there who are posting one picture that's in one tone at one time and then immediately into a very business oriented post the next. So it's okay to kind of, or it's great to evangelize that feeling of you can be both. Um, and the third is constructing tonal pillars for your influencer archetype pre vetting and also communicating them to the influencer during briefing. So you know, again, some brands are, some brands are very different to others. So um, having this framework and saying this is the tone and the um, lens through which we have selected you and why we feel that you're a great fit for our brand and this is the type of tone that we want you to bring to the content can be really helpful. So another thing that's different, um, TikTok is a very sound on platform and there is a lot of discussion about using trending sounds to boost performance um, and, you know, how the brand should get involved in challenges that are trending and all of that sort of thing. So there's a lot of confusion out there about what we can and can't do. Uh, so we've created this little cheat sheet here for you on what is and is not okay. So we can get into some FAQs here. So a, a key one is, can I get an influencer to join a viral challenge that's featuring hit music? Sadly, you cannot. That's a copyright infringement, uh, seeing as it would be being used for commercial use if you're paying that influencer. So they're welcome to do that organically, but if there's a financial exchange between you, it's a copyright infringement. Uh, what if there's credit to the musician? Brown, brown, still no good. Uh, is there a free music option? Absolutely, it's in the app. Can I get rights for hit music for commercial use? You absolutely can. You do have to contact the copyright holder, which is typically the artist or the record label, uh, to be able to facilitate that. And the costs vary wildly, as you can imagine, because there's emerging artists, there's huge artists. Um, so it's definitely an option, but one that takes some pre-planning and lead time uh, and budget. Should we create our own sound to start our own trend is a big one. Um, this can be a really great option but it does need to happen with research and strategy. So brands really shouldn't just be creating their own sound for the sake of creating it, especially with a feeling that you have to. Um, there needs to be a deep understanding of the types of sounds that are really resonating with people in your vertical or in the type of content that you're looking for. So for beauty and skincare, that's a lot of ASMR style sounds. And there are a lot of brands who are engaging creators who make those sounds to make them for the brand and then using a big cohort of influencers to get that sound off the ground and start to see some adoption from other users. So that's the ASMR is kind of the broad, um, you know, example for beauty and skincare for lots of other brands and verticals, um, it, catchy music with some kind of big drop or moment of change. Um, are the sounds that tend to perform the best because it does play into the kind of shock moment or transition moment that is so native to the platform. So there is a lot that you, that you can do with creating your own sounds, um, but it just means that you have to, you know, have some research, do some um, ideation around what actually will work and why you're doing it. And the final one is, is speaking to camera effective, which because there's been so much conversation around trending sounds and how it all works and how it can be great for boosting performance, often there's this forgotten huge portion of content on TikTok where it's people creating content with their own voice, either to camera like a lifestyle influencer would on Instagram, or they could be creating 
skill sharing content like uh, we were speaking to before of education as entertainment. There's also a lot of trends that you can participate in that don't require the trending sound, but that require the trend to be spoken by the actual influencer. Um, so there's lots of different options here and there's a lot of brands that aren't playing by these rules. So that adds to the confusion. Um, but it's something that, again, looking back at industry history, when the FTC came out and said that everyone had to use disclosures on Instagram, it took a while to pick up, but then there was some big wrist slaps. So uh, we all need to start playing by the rules or keep playing by the rules um, and avoid being one of those brands that, you know, um, is slapped on the wrist in a big way. Um, okay, so another difference. And how are we going for time? Okay, great. We're jamming. Um, so another big difference is the performance turbulence on TikTok. Um, I think this is the one that does really worry marketers and has everyone scratching their heads. Of like, well, we followed all the best practices. We did this, we did that. Like, what, what did we do wrong here? Um, and it's just really important to realize that the two platforms do function in fundamentally different ways. And it is, it is more turbulent again on TikTok. So Instagram's goal is to show you content from people that you already follow. Um, I've used the analogy before that it's like a blue apron meal. You know what you're getting. It's coming to you exactly what you ordered and that's Instagram. Whereas TikTok's goal is to show you the content irrespective of whether or not you follow someone that they think at that specific time that you are going to enjoy the most. So it's a little bit more like going to your grandma's house and having them cook whatever she thinks you'll like. And usually it's delicious, but sometimes maybe it's not. Um, so this means two things. It does mean the content performance is more turbulent. Um, it, that's also, it's got to be something that we're all become a little bit more comfortable with. The only way to become successful as a brand on TikTok is to have a really solid base, not just of industry best practices, but also learnings for your brand specifically and what you've seen work and what you've seen, have, what you, what hasn't. Um, so, you know, TikTok in many ways is similar to Twitter where people who are successful on Twitter only need a handful of posts a week that are doing incredibly well and getting retweeted and shared. And that's what makes them successful on Twitter, but they have a bunch of tweets in their feed that aren't doing as well. So it's a nice kind of frame of reference to think of it a little bit more in that way than comparative to Instagram. It also means that the audience size doesn't come into the equation as significantly as it does on Instagram when it comes to performance. So that can be a nerve wracking thing. It can be a confusing thing and pricing and there's lots of different brands approaching pricing in different ways. Um, and it's just really important to continue to think about audience versus influence and really understand the types of creators that you're trying to work with and the type of dynamic that they have with their audience and the type of reaction that people could have who aren't following them to the type of content they're creating. If, you know, this big blue dip at the bottom of the screen is making anyone particularly nervous, there is always boosting as a safeguard to get that minimum views number. Um, but it's still, even with that, really important to be tracking organic performance as closely as you can, um, to be testing and learning as much as possible. So the next thing that's new is this expectation of virality as the measure of success. Um, you know, viral brand challenges and branded UGC also used to be KPIs for influencer marketing in, uh, on Instagram. And things kind of moved away from that after a short period of time because it wasn't something that was sustainable for all brands to do. Um, and it wasn't something that was possible for all brands to do. So some of the examples that we have here are from Chipotle. Um, and Chipotle are a great example of a brand who are absolutely killing it on TikTok but it's not out of nowhere. They've been investing so heavily in social for the last decade. That has meant investing in testing. That has meant hiring the best people in social. That has meant showing up in these environments and communities in authentic ways for a really long time and really showing that they can hang, so to speak. Um, and so it is a brand who's been able to jump into TikTok and be incredibly successful. They also have a very accessible product, which makes it very easy for audiences to jump into challenges but that's not the reality for every single brand. So if you don't have that social cachet, 
there's not an easy fast lane um, other than potentially huge amount of budget. Um, there, there are brands who hit it and nail it, but again, it's not something that we can all sustain as the measure of success of did the TikTok campaign go well or not? Well, did it go viral? And that seems to be the industry conversation at the moment. So seeing a couple of billion or million views on your brand's hashtag is awesome, but it's not going to happen every day and it's not going to last forever. So we want to learn from industry history and see that, you know, building sustainable strategies and investing in um, prioritizing persuasion over viral performance is really, really integral. So how do we do that? Uh, so we've got some tips on building a sustainable strategy. So the first one is starting by listening. So searching relevant ha category hashtags to find native content that your brand can authentically work within. Remembering that you don't want to be the person who shows up to the party and changes the music. You want to dance before you DJ. Um, so, you know, just get a feel for everything before you come in and say, here's how I want it to be exactly done because that approach just isn't going to work. Um, the next is controls versus variables. So thinking through however you can introduce some controls into a platform that is really turbulent. So one way is contracting influencers for multiple rounds of content. So at least they are the control. Um, you're then testing different types of content from that creator over a series of time and seeing what works and what doesn't. Compounding learnings in general is something that the influencer marketing industry often isn't great at. Um, we often get briefs where we don't have any learnings from prior campaigns or we don't have any understanding of what has or has not worked for this brand and we have to do our own digging and research. Um, and that's something that we, especially on a platform that is still as young as TikTok, we need to be treating every campaign as an opportunity to get those learnings. Posting once and measuring twice. Um, so this is just one, one metric, but engagement being tracked as follower count, likes and comments versus follower count and likes and comments versus views. Um, but it's also, you know, everyone's interested in what the key metrics are for TikTok. We are measuring everything we possibly can. Um, and like Instagram, every campaign will have different KPIs depending on what we're looking to achieve. Um, but more than Instagram, it is important to understand likes and comments versus both of these things because the views are coming from different sources. So making sure we're tracking where that's all coming from as well. Project and reflect. So project views based on averages, but be wary of any viral outliers. Um, look at the view sources when you're analyzing your campaign's performance. So what got you on the For You page? What didn't? How was the engagement for the content that was largely from the audience versus engagement from new audiences? What can you learn from that and how can you build that into your next program? Live in the comments. Uh, the kids talk, listen and learn. The specific is universal. So as we saw with, again, Amazon versus OXO, there's so much that you can learn just from what people are thinking when they see this content, from digging into those comments and really analyzing them instead of just looking at the metrics. Um, and finally, asking for buy-in. So either concept review from influencers um, or you can, if you have your own existing concept, it is still a good idea to include some kind of disclaimer language that says we're really excited to work with you on this concept we feel really great about it because we're tracking towards these specific goals and kpis but we know that you know your audience and you understand what you think is going to resonate with them um, do you have any flags is there any concern in creating this type of content to meet our kpis very important, again, to think back to that idea of building the fence and letting them play, that it's not just about handing over creative control. It's also being really clear about your needs and why you're investing in them and what you're hoping to get from it. And so with all of that, I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Roshana to talk us through some white space opportunity and show us some sample profiles. And then if we have time, we'll get into some Q&A. Hello everyone, I'm Roshana as Grace introduced and I am a junior creative strategist here at Four. Um, today we're going to jump into uh, white space. So what we've talked about is the reluctance of many brands to jump into TikTok. 
whether it's due to fear, uh, not knowing how to use a platform, or simply not knowing if the platform is beneficial to your particular brand. Um, that simply means that TikTok has a huge amount of white space and opportunity for share the voice from content creators who have like huge followings um, that are engaged, but aren't yet doing many sponsored posts. Um, so I'm going to take you through a handful of profiles who have an audience of over 100K, great engagement, and less than that 3% uh, sponsored content. And in, for a little bit of reference, uh, the average sponsored content percentage on Instagram uh, for people with 100 to 500K followers is about 21%. So comparatively, uh, the share of voice is huge. So although the accounts that I may present to you may not fit your exact brand, um, we hope it encourages you to explore TikTok as a platform. Um, in fact, Four has added TikTok, um, TikTok creators to our discovery platform. Uh, so it, it's tailored to your search based on hashtags in your category, uh, be it fashion, lifestyle, fitness, sustainability, and a ton of demographics to even chime into um, who exactly it is that you're looking for for your brand. So uh, let's get into discussing uh, a few of the TikTok creators that I came across and the team came across that we thought it'd be great to because they have niche accounts. So the first account is One Salting. One Salting has raised the bar when it comes to giving uh, advice, uh, valuable advice that is. I know that uh, Sophie mentioned that it is a space where Gen Z is giving a lot of unsolicited advice, but I, I, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that this is a, a safe account. Um, he uses his TikTok platform to educate individuals on how to get hired, um, and even if they're just seeking to change career. Um, career consulting can be very expensive and sometimes a bit difficult to find. Um, based on what exactly you're looking for. I would say that One Salting has a large variety of content uh, and he just currently partnered with ZipRecruiter. Uh, we can see him in so many different lanes. When we talk about to the moon, I'm not mentioning stock. I'm simply referring to um, where, where you can be in the future. So for industries, we know that he's currently working with hiring platforms such as Zip um, Recruiter, and there's room for him to grow in that space, but also stationary, um, the pens he used, uh, the notebooks that he's using to uh, present this information on his TikTok platform. Next is Now It's Clean. So now it's clean is making uh, cleaning seem like less of a chore and more of the fun thing to do. It's part of that whole clean top world. Um, if you're not on it, highly suggest joining it. Um, so now it's clean educates individuals on how to correctly clean their homes or the, the proper products to use and making sure that you're not whipping up some thing that might blow your house down, just showing you the right way to do things. Um, now it's clean has no recent partnerships, um, but it's a perfect place, of course, for obviously any and all cleaning products. Next, uh, personal favorite, 047, specializes in making a variety of mixed, uh, mixed beverages. So TikTok's own, I'll call it Mix Master. Um, a little over 100K for audience size, but in terms of like uh, views, average views, they're doing pretty good. Um, the feed is full of aesthetically pleasing like concoctions um, that's sure to make you thirsty, but also you'll grab a second look, make you think, oh, how can my brand fit into this? Um, so Over 7 has had very few partnerships, but they're perfect for tea, coffee, caffeinated beverages, non-caffeinated beverages. Um, I would even go as so far to say they're perfect for brands that create glassware. A lot of the um, drinks that they're creating on their platform um, is made with glass straws as well as uh, glass cups. Next. So we're going to take a look into individuals that I'd say is using the platform more of like vlog style. So it's Daniel Mack. He quickly catapulted to like TikTok stardom when several videos of him uh, went viral for asking people what exactly is it that they do for a living. Um, he was intrigued by luxury cars. He used prominent areas um, across the U.S. and 
once he sees individuals coming out, he asks, you know, what is it that you do for a living? Um, thus far, Daniel has only partnered with Caravan, um, but there's so much room for him, obviously in the automotive industry, but also um, financial. He's asking individuals what it is that they do for a living. And nine times out of 10, they go into a little bit of detail and they're like, you should do this if you want to get into investment. So brands that their sole, pro um, sole purpose is to promote ambition and success, um, definitely, definitely an area that uh, Daniel and, and brands can do some type of work together. And last but surely not least, we have Jasmine Garden. Um, she's a space for everything and anything that's positive. Uh, she shares horoscopes, uh, the ins and outs of Mercury retrograde, and this is particularly what her page is about, everything positive. Um, our personal TikTok bestie. Uh, so overall, TikTok isn't a platform to be afraid of. Um, I noticed that there's a lot of brands that begin using the account and then out of they, they do some type of trendy content and then out of nowhere, it's gone. They uh, poof, no longer. Um, they become placeholders instead of space holders. And I'm here to tell you that TikTok isn't something to be afraid of. It's a home of many worlds. So I hope you, you know, choose to explore it. And I'm going to pass it over to Grace. Amazing. Thank you so much, Roshana. I know we're nearly coming up on time. So we've got some key takeaways up on the screen. I know there's been some questions in the Q&A box about if this will be recorded and shared. It is going to be recorded and shared. It'll be on the FOURS YouTube channel. So, you know, like and subscribe, head over to FOURS YouTube channel. Um, and a lot of the questions, again, knowing we only have a couple of minutes, are about measurement and are about how to set KPIs. So, Something that is the same as Instagram, again, is that the KPIs do vary depending on what you're looking to achieve. Um, someone in the Q&A box specifically said, well, if you isn't a sale, so how do we evangelize the importance of that? Um, it's all just about the funnel. And if, if you're getting incredible views, that's amazing for awareness. It could be great for consideration, especially if you're looking at those um, the comment sentiment. Um, but again, the more that you can measure at this point, the better, because at this point in time in the industry's history, it's still very much about building a solid foundation of learning, building a solid foundation of wins and also potential losses to determine what is going to work and what doesn't work. And again, not just looking to broad industry benchmarks and uh, best practices, but also taking those as the base and then applying them to your brand to figure out the exact approaches and techniques and tactics that are going to work best for you. Um, so I hope that's helpful. And I know that's a very quick wrap up. We all, I, I think it was myself that really uh, was a little too loquacious throughout the time and didn't leave a lot of time for Q&A. But we want to thank everyone for joining. We would love to hear any more questions that you have. Um, so please feel free to reach out at hello at four.co. Um, and thank you again for joining. Uh, so this will be available on the four YouTube and we'll also be sending you all out a takeaway document with some of these takeaways a little more broken out. Um, and thanks again.